I'd like to, to start today where I think a lot of us who are educators in the room started for ourselves, which is in the decision to become an educator, right? In, in why teach? Why do what we do? Why, why do the work? And, uh, and why AVID? For me, the reason I became an educator, there, I have to tell you, there are some sad elements to my story, but uh, without giving away the ending overtly, it ends up pretty well, right? Things have worked out pretty well for me. Um, as a child, in America, we have um, different tracks for students, um, and the top track in a lot of places is called gifted and talented. It seems like a kind of a strange title to give because I think all children have gifts that are unique to them, but we apply this label to uh, a few students, and that was a label that was applied to me as a young man. My father liked to tease me and say that my greatest gift was for being a smart ass, but I don't think that's the reason that the school applied to put me in that track. So I had a, um, some advantages, certainly as a young man in school, but before very long, those advantages started to be shrouded by the challenges that my family came to face. My parents were divorced when I was young, and I, and I was living predominantly with my mother. And, and that, was, that was fine. A lot of kids, especially in America, experience divorce when they're young. But in my late middle school years, year seven, eight, my mother started to lose a battle with alcoholism. That runs in my family and it's been an unfortunate cycle. But with that battle with alcoholism came emotional chaos in the home. I was never sure what kind of personality I was coming home to. Home was not a, a safe, comfortable place for me to be. My mother lost her job, and then with that came poverty and the stresses and challenges that come along with that poverty. After a few years of that, the stress had really sunk into who I was. And there was some despair, some apathy for academics that came along with that. And there was a hunger. Now, it, it wasn't hunger for food. We were fortunate our, uh, our government and our church took care of us to, to help put food on the table when my family couldn't. But there was a different kind of hunger. Uh, the American author Richard Wright said that a man can starve as easily from a lack of self-realization as from a lack of bread. And that lack of self-realization was the initial hunger that I was starting to feel as a young man. And it was those initial pangs of hunger that were in my soul when I met two teachers that just sparked a hope in my life that still burns to this day. They were the ones who helped turn that hunger from something that was slowing me down, that was debilitating, that was preventing me from going forward into a hunger for excellence and a hunger for a drive for more and more. I would love to have the time to tell you everything about these two men, but I have a flight on Saturday, and so there just isn't enough time to tell you everything about these two guys. But I would like to instead focus on what they made me feel as a student about myself. The, the feelings that they gave to me. They made me feel, at a time when I wasn't feeling this in other places in my life, they made me feel valued. They made me feel that I had worth, that I had a contribution to make, and that I really mattered. Their attention to me, their affection toward me and their students made me feel those things. They made me feel like someone believed in me, that they saw this, these capabilities and these talents and this potential that I had no idea existed in me, but they saw in me. And so as, as I came to trust their belief, I started to develop some of that trust in myself and that belief in myself. What I think was most important about these two men is that both of them demanded my absolute best work. They knew that the outside world wasn't going to lower their expectations for me, and so I had to rise and meet the expectations of the world. And so they supported me along the way, but they demanded my very best work. I might have been satisfied with, with B-level work, but they were disappointed in me with B-level work because of their expectations. I think every child deserves to have people in their lives, people in their school lives, that do these things for them, that believe in them, that value them, and that hold very high expectations for them. And at a time in my life when I was bankrupt of belief and that hope had been extinguished from my heart, 
these men relit that flame in me. They took that hunger and they turned it into a hunger for something more, to achieve, to grow, to live a fulfilling life. This was such a powerful transformation for me. And when I left high school, I felt compelled and called to go on and to do this for others. This is why I teach, because of that gift that was given to me. And that's the, that's the work, that's the gift, that's the opportunity that AVID gives us to do into the lives of others, to give students hope. And when I say hope, I don't mean hope as in I hope my plane takes off on time or I hope that I get on the right tram trying to get around the city. Hope in a much deeper sense. There's an organization in America called the Gallup Organization, and they're famous for doing all kinds of polling from politics to to well-being and and, uh, quality of life. And they've done some very interesting work around this idea of hope and what it means for students. Their definition of hope aligns with an ancient virtue of hope. It is, it is both the belief in a great future and the confidence to make that be, to make that come to be so. A deep belief in both an optimism for what's going to come for me and the skills and the efficacy to make it happen, right? This combination that I think is so important to, to spark in our students. And it's this mindset that I think we want to have in in all of our students, this mindset that I see in the students that we'll meet later today, that they have the power, they have the agency and the efficacy to go out and make a great future for themselves. And the work that they've done, the research behind this has found that for students who are high in hope, who say that they have multiple ways to make that great future come to be, that they have a great expectation for what's going to come for them, and that they have an adult in their lives who believes in that future for them, this is worth about 12 percentage points in productivity or achievement. It's worth about a letter grade if you you hold uh, IQ even across the board. That's what hope is worth, hope matters. But even more, I I think, promising than that is that their research has found that hope is a better indicator of college success than any of our university entrance exams, the SAT or the ACT in America, hope is a better predictor of college success than that, and a better predictor of college success than GPA. Hope matters, sparking these feelings in our students, this self-belief and this optimism for what is to come and the power to go get it, this really deeply matters for our students. And when I think about the AVID program and AVID teachers, I really think we stand at the gates to that hope. We stand between where some of our students are in the darkness of doubt, pulling them, urging them to walk through those gates into the light of hope and possibility. And this can be an incredible challenge for the students. I had a group of AVID students that I was with for four years. They graduated this past June. And so I know their stories well. And they face some incredible challenges, some incredible twists and turns that made that gate seem so far away from them. They faced eviction from their homes, multiple students. A couple of those students had been abused themselves. Two had faced homelessness during their four years in high school. Some of them had faced depression, anorexia, parents fighting addiction in their homes. The gates of hope can seem so far away when that's what, those are the doubts that are part of your life. It can seem impossibly far away. And that's why they need us. That's why they need teachers standing in those gates, beckoning and calling them and urging them and telling them that they can walk through to that other side, to that light of possibility of what can be the future in their lives. And that's where you can be. One person in that gate matters. One person can have that power. It happened in my life, knowing the power of that teacher to pull me through and see that hope, to walk through the gate and see what was on the other side. I don't, to the teachers in the room, please never doubt your magnetism, your joy, your power to instill that hope in students, to give them like an irresistible siren's song, the urge to come through those gates and see what's possible for them on the other side. 
I want to tell you the story of one particular student who graduated from our AVID program a few years ago. His name was Isaiah. He came to school. He had transferred from out of state. He quietly did his work in the back of his English classroom. And his English teacher started to notice that this young man was bright. He wasn't participating in class. He was sitting back quietly. But the work that he did was quality work. And so she recommended him to me as as an avid student. Isaiah was not very interested to join AVID in the first place. And so I had to kind of pester him a little bit. I was passing him notes in the hallway. Want to be an engineer? Want to change your life? Want to go to college? Putting it on his desk, walking through his English classroom. And eventually, he relented. I think he never thought I would leave him alone for the rest of his high school career. And he asked if he could give it a chance. And so Isaiah joined our AVID class. And I came to learn that he wasn't just bright He was absolutely brilliant. But as I got to know him a little bit more, I found out what was holding him back a little bit. Isaiah had a part-time job, and sometimes he didn't uh, have a ride to get there. And against all of the uh, advice and wise advice from my colleagues, when when I knew this was Uh, a factor in his family's income, and I knew that he had to get there. Once in a while, I would give him a ride to his job. And during those conversations, I came to learn that Isaiah's mother was a manic depressive, and so he didn't know what kind of personality he was returning home to, that his family lived in abject poverty. They had next to nothing, and this job went to their rent. I learned that his brother had chosen to give up on his family. He joined a gang in Baltimore, and in one calendar year, he had brought home three stab wounds and two bullet holes back into their home. And his brother is imprisoned today. But for Isaiah, when he saw that other people, other teachers had rallied around him and they had a belief in him, you could see over time him start to change his his affect his confidence, who he was, started to transform. We moved him through the levels of classes in our school into higher and higher courses, and throughout it all, Isaiah started to really dig into those challenges. He got nothing less than an A for the remainder of his high school career after joining AVID, regardless of the challenges that we put in front of him. He went on to earn the highest score on our university entrance exam of any student in the entire school. He was admitted to five colleges, and he got a full scholarship to attend University of Maryland College Park, which is a great school in our state, and he is now a junior computer science major who is thriving at college. This is the power of having a program, of having a belief in the growth possibilities of students. He is an incredible young man, and it took time, and it took a lot of hard work and some convincing for him to get there. But Isaiah's story is just one of so many that I have been blessed to witness over the years in my AVID program. And every time, I'm reminded of two things. One is the power of the human spirit and the power of young people to make their lives happen for themselves. And the second is the great influence of having a mentor, an adult, who believes in you when you're young to make that happen. I have to remind us all that we know the work is not easy. It reminds me of this old story about the man who gets his car stuck in a muddy hole. Gets his car stuck in this muddy hole, and a farmer comes along and he says, I'll tow your car out, but it's going to cost you 50 bucks because it's the 10th time I've had to do it today. And the guy says to the farmer, the 10th time? When do you plow your fields? At night? The farmer says, no, 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 no. Night is when I fill the hole with water. It can often feel like there are a lot of muddy holes getting filled in front of us as teachers. Our work sometimes just feels like it keeps getting harder. It happens to everyone, but I want to just remind you that we can fill those holes. We can clear that path. And you all are are AVID trained or about to be AVID trained, and so either you love strategies or you will come to love strategies over the next few days. And so I want to share with you just a few of the themes of my classroom and my work that I think a lot of strategies can fit into that's made a difference for my students. And these are just the the ABCs of what's, what's been successful in my classroom. The first, the A, is for affect and affection. 
I think it's so important to remember that as teachers, our affect, our mood, our personality really sets the temperature for learning in that classroom, that so much feeds off of who we are and the personality that we bring into the classroom, the joy and love that we can show for the learning and the work and the students and how that rubs off on them. And then secondly, and so important there, is the affection that we can show for our students. The brain science behind what happens to our minds and our learning abilities when we're in a positive place is so powerful. When we feel positive about what we're doing compared to negative or neutral, it's 31% more productive. When we feel happy, we have a happiness advantage. When you choose joy and you choose positivity and we help students feel that, they are smarter, <laughs> they're more productive. That's what we want. On the other side of that, extreme stress that comes sometimes with scarcity and challenges, that, that equates to the loss of 13 IQ points. It's like operating without a night's sleep. I think as teachers, we need to really consider how can we create an oasis of positivity and grace and joy for our students to come into in that classroom so that they can kind of try to divorce themselves from that stress and enjoy the joy of being in there. There's a lot of technical psychology behind this. Thankfully, my wife is an AP psychology teacher, and she just told me to remember this. Instead of mood congruency or affective learning, she said, just remember that emotion is the glue for learning, right? Emotion's the glue for learning. The second is the image of a buoy. Now, I think you call this a boy. Here's the thing that bobs up and down in the harbor, right? And that was a buoy in America. I didn't want to say boy, because I didn't want to think everything that had to be a boy in order to do this strategy, and there are no operations needed to do this. But this idea of a buoy, something that is, that is constant, that as the waves come, as tidal waves of challenge comes, that it just keeps bobbing there, that it's a constant, that it's reliable, that it will always be there. I think as the challenges and the tidal waves of, of disappointment or joy hits our students, that we can remain that constant for them. And so much of that has to do with us finding balance in our own lives, us making sure that we are emotionally fit to be able to give to students when they need and making sure that we are in a, in a, in a good place ourselves to remain that constant, remain that buoy that students can grab onto when life gets crazy around them. And then C is for the word challenge. Right? To, to always be challenging ourselves as teachers to grow, to improve, but also to share a challenge with our students, to challenge them to be their best. I think it's one thing to, to have joy, but it's a whole other to find the true power in meeting challenges and making the most out of those opportunities. These aren't your typical professional development strategies, but this human connection, these relationships that are forged through this has been all the difference in my classroom teaching. I wanna close with just one more quick story from a student in one of my classes. A young na lady named Lauren was in my class and she was also taking a ceramics pottery class in our school. And when they had finished their projects, they were each allowed to invite one teacher to a tea party. Now, as a rule, I never turned down invitations to tea parties, so I was happy to be Lauren's guest to this tea party. We're sitting there in the classroom, and, and I have zero artistic ability whatsoever. Uh, I, I can't sing for a lick. I, I, a three-dimensional cube is like the best I can draw. And so I'm looking at these incredible works of art that these students had produced. And I said to Lauren, how is it possible that you can see just a lump of clay and imagine it to become this beautiful pitcher, right, or this mug that we're, that we're using today? How is it possible to see a blank canvas and imagine the beautiful portrait that's going to be there. She said that her art teacher had talked to them about that and she called it this term hyper-seeing, seeing what isn't quite there yet. And her art teacher shared this quote from Michelangelo that kind of put it all in perspective. When someone asked him this question about how he had carved this beautiful statue, his response was, I saw the angel in the marble, and I carved until I set it free. As I sat there with Lauren, and I thought about her, and I thought about my work as a teacher, I thought, what a beautiful metaphor for what we do as teachers. 
We see the talent, the ability, the brilliance in students, and we teach until we set that free. And so as we go forth here from, from here, I, I just like that image to stay with you, the way that you can use your, your carving tools of hope, of being a buoy, of challenging them, of having affection for the work and love for the students, and how you can use that to set free their brilliance. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you for the work you do every single day with your students. Thanks so much.